several presentations on idle loans as well as idle grants. And you can go back and look at the presentations in the um, SBDC Presentation Center. So there was additional extension of the uh, application deadlines to apply for idle loans, as well as there was a change with idle grants. The change was in the original CARES Act, Congress said that small business owners could get $10,000 in idle grants. The SBA went back and revised it, and they issued guidance saying, no, you can't get $10,000. What we will allow you to get is up to $10,000, but it all depends on how much, how many employees you have. So you could only get $1,000 per employee. So a person that had three employees could only get $3,000, not $10,000. We disagreed with the SBAs. When I say we, practitioners like myself, we disagreed with the SBA's interpretation of that. So Congress came back in this act and said, no, people can qualify for up to $10,000 in grants, but they also added a couple of caveats. One caveat is you had to have 300 or less employees to qualify for the full $10,000 grant. The other one was that you had to be located in a low income neighborhood. And right now we are waiting to see what low income is defined, what neighborhoods are defined as being low income. We don't have any guidance on that um, right now. And then the third one is that you also had to experience a 30% reduction in income in order to qualify for the, 10, the full $10,000 grant. You can move to the next slide. All right, so who's eligible for the second round? All right. It's similar to what the eligibility for the first round, that's the first starting point. And again, I won't go back through that because we have plenty of presentations on that earlier this year, well, last year. So you must meet the first round of eligibility, right? So these are the kinds of businesses, when you look at this chart, that qualified for PPP. It was small businesses, nonprofit organizations, veteran organizations, tribal businesses, um, small agricultural cooperatives that meet the SBA size standards. And then you also had sole proprietors, self-employed individual, individuals or independent contractors. New with the second round are certain news organizations, destination marketing organizations, housing cooperatives, and 501c6s may also be eligible. The second round applicants, the business must not have more than 300 employees. The business must have at least a 25% reduction in revenues in at least one quarter in 2020 when compared to previous quarters. And that's really a look back at 2019. Also, the business that got a first PPP loan must have used or plan to use their full PPP loan. So we're going to go into that, this part a little bit more in detail. All right, so how much can I get? The maximum loan for the second round is $2 million. Um, an eligible entity may receive only one second draw. That's important. And first time borrowers, it still appears that they can get up to $10 million. As before, a business may qualify for 2.5 times the average monthly payroll cost. And you can arrive at this figure. You have a couple of ways to arrive at this figure. You can look at your average monthly payroll cost for 2019 and multiply by 2.5. Or you can use a alternate schedule, which is like a staggered one year period before the date the loan is made. You can go to the next slide, Daniel, please. It advanced, do you see it? No, I don't see it. Oh, hold on, what's happening? For some reason it stopped sharing. Bear with me, folks. Okay, well, she's, I'll just go a little bit more and explain what it means by the one year period before the date the loan is made. So the two alternate calculations, 
And this is for businesses that don't begin with um, NAS code 72. Businesses that begin with that code actually are like hospitality businesses, restaurants, entertainment industries. They have a different calculation. They get 3.5 months of payroll. So when you're talking about calculating the payroll, you can look at the full year of 2019 or you can um, do a staggered year, like I said. So if you decide to apply for PPP in March, then what you may look at is February of 2019 to February 2020 in order to do the calculation. Is that the right slide, Beverly? Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. There, some certain types of businesses are ineligible, and that's businesses normally not eligible for SBA loans, businesses where the primary activity is lobbying, businesses with at least 20% ownership in China, and publicly traded companies are not eligible to receive the second round, well, the new PPP loans. All right. Payroll is defined as the, the original, as the same as under the CARES Act, which, which is the act that granted the first PPP set of PPP. And um, salary wages, commissions, or other compensation up to $100,000 annually. So if you have a highly compensated individual and that person makes $150,000 you can only use $100,000 in order to calculate the amount of PPP that the company is entitled to, right? So also payment of cash tips or equivalents. Also as part of payroll, payment for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, allowance for dismissal or separation, also employee benefits, retirement benefits, payment of state or local tax, assess on the compensation of employees, and new to this round is group benefits as group life, disability, vision, or dental insurance. So you can see the expansion under this, this, this round of PPP. How is funding calculated, all right? So you wanna make sure that you calculate your funding correctly. This also helps you determine your eligibility. So you wanna compare gross receipts. It is a quarter by quarter comparison. If there's a 25% reduction over two quarters, then you may qualify for the second round of PPP. So what I tell my clients is that, hey, let's pull your 2019 um, financial statements and let's look at your 20, compare them against your 2020 financial statements, right? So we look quarter by quarter to see if there's a 25% reduction. So for instance, we, we compare first quarter 2019 against first quarter 2020, right? Then we look at second quarter 2019 against second quarter 2020, third quarter against third quarter 2020. And it's funny because I was talking to one of my clients yesterday and I called him first thing in the morning and I said, hey, um, we need to look to see whether or not you qualify for PPP. And he says, Attorney Winstead, I made more money last year. I don't think I qualify. I said, well, you may have made more money on the whole, but we need to go back and look quarter by quarter to see whether or not there was a 25% reduction in any of those quarters to see whether or not you qualify for PPP, right? So that's why it's important. And we've been saying this for ever, for a long time, that you have to have your books and records in order because that's one of the things you need in order to prove that you have the 25% reduction. It's a look on a quarterly basis. And Beverly, we, we talk about this a lot in business, period, right? Like your taxes need to be done. Your taxes, the taxes need, need to be done. Be done. Um, the SBA, they are doing more in terms of background research now, where we filed an idle appeal for a client and now SBA is asking the client to submit tax returns going back to 2017, right? So because of the amount of fraud in the, the these programs, 
your tax returns have to be done and they should be done. And you should have accurate books and records too. And do you recommend that people hire somebody to do this for them, especially if they've got to go back to 217? Because I know folks that got their loan, but are still in the rears in terms of their taxes. And how is that going to affect this next round and even the forgiveness for the round that they had if they're in the rear with their taxes? Right. So, I mean, getting taxes done is really part of your uh, duty as a U.S. citizen, <laughs> as a taxpayer. Right. For for purposes of the program, the the CARES Act nor the Consolidated Appropriations Act, really, they don't really say that you have to go back to 2017 and 2018. Um, they do look specifically at 2019. So you absolutely have to have 2019 done. And I would even say 2020, right, to arrive at whether or not you qualify for the second round of PPP. I think it's a good thing to go back and do 2018, 2019, uh, 2017, only because the SBA now is looking at that and requesting that information. And they're not necessarily requesting it from you. They're doing a 4506T and sending the document straight to IRS to pull the tax returns, right? Uh -huh. They're comparing to see whether or not you were in business, like you said you, you were, um, because part of the requirement for PPP is that you had to be, have been in business prior to February 15, 2020. So that's one of the things they're looking at. The other thing is they're looking to see whether or not there was truly economic injury. Mm -hmm. All right, so the other part of the calculation, some people actually weren't in business for full 2019. So they can't do the comparison first quarter against first quarter, right? First quarter 2019 against first quarter 2020. So what happens when you're not in business? You may have started business, your business in December of 2019. Then my understanding, and I mean, I don't know if the SBA is going to further clarify this, but if you weren't in business, if you were in business, you only started your business third or fourth quarter. My understanding is that you can look at any quarter in 2020 and compare it to see whether or not um, there's a 25% 25, 25 reduction, which if there is, then you should qualify. Well, that's one of the that's one of the qualifying factors for you to get the second round of PPP. Is there loan forgiveness for PPP loans? Yes, we finally got a Christmas present, Danielle. We're <laughs> waiting and waiting and waiting and we're all on the edge of our seats for so long, right? Right. And so, yeah, when the president signed into law, it was clear that there was going to be PPP loan forgiveness. In fact, there is a more simplified form for people that got loans for $150,000 or less. That the last I checked, it actually has not been put out yet. But I know the SBA had 24 days to um, draft the the one page forgiveness application. So, so here's, you're gonna... here's, here's a question, Beverly. Some people have been paying back. You know how they sent you this voucher and saying, "Well, the loan isn't due yet, but you can pay fifty seven dollars and so you can start now." If they started paying that voucher and started paying on that loan early and then it's forgiven, are they going to get that payment back? So you may be confusing PPP with idle. So oh, okay. The come straight from the SBA and that's for the idle loans and that's not forgivable. So if they want to start paying on that, they can. Okay. There is, I think, an 18-month deferment before the first payment is due. So, I mean, they can start paying, but... As far as PPP, remember PPP loans, um, you're going to be coordinating with the bank. Right, and right, right. And because the bank has your information, more than likely, I think most of the banks included in their contract paperwork that they have a right to automatically debit your bank account for the loan amount if it's not forgiven. Oh. So many different layers, Beverly, to keep up with. I know, I know. I'm, tr I'm trying to keep up with it. <laughs> it's a lot. And this is what you do for a living. I'm like, whew, let me wipe my brow. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. So all right, for PPP loan forgiveness, it will require the borrower to report the number of employees um, retained due to the PPP loan. This is important because Congress wants to see that their intent, remember the whole intent behind the Paycheck Protection Program was to keep American or to keep the labor force 
employee. And so it's important that you report the number of employees retained during the PP loan, PPP loan process. If you're self-employed, you report yourself, right? Right. So you also want to report the estimated amount of loan proceeds spent on payroll. Remember, you had to spend um, at a minimum 60% of the PPP loans that you received on payroll. The other 40% could go to mortgage or interest or rent or um, utilities, as long as these were business expenses and they were um, your business expenses prior to February 15th, 2020, right? right? And so the other thing is they want to see the total amount of the loan. So you need to report that. And then the borrower will have to certify that they complied with the requirements of the loan. And you must retain the records to prove compliance. The employment related records must be retained for at least four years. And then the utilities, all that other stuff, those records, three years. It's important that you retain the records. Why? The under the CARES Act, the Congress appropriated $25 million to the inspector general to investigate PPP fraud and idle fraud, right? Mm -hmm. Under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, Congress appropriated $50 million for the Inspector General to investigate fraud. So they have the money, they will be investigating, and it's important- They are coming for people. (laughs) Yeah, and they're coming for people. So do not only just have hard copies, we're in the age of digital, right? So. I, you know, because I help people with IRS problems and people going through audits, there are plenty of times when we can't produce documents in an audit because a taxpayer tells me that they, uh, the the records were in their basement and it was a flood in the basement or the house caught on fire or something. You guys should be scanning these records, putting them on flash drive or putting them somewhere in the cloud. That way you can always retrieve this when it's time to produce. Good advice. All right, so you also want to track how you spend your PPP for funds to be um, forgiven. You definitely need to, like I said, just make sure you spend it on the things that you can spend them on, which is payroll, your mortgage, utilities, and then we're going to get to a couple of other additions under this new PPP, the second round, in a later slide. The other thing is what we've been telling you all along, you don't want to co-mingle monies. You want to uh, hopefully open a separate bank account and deposit your PPP money. Same thing that we told you the, the first round, right? If you did the separate bank account the first round, there's nothing wrong with, and you've spent down the money, which hopefully most people have spent down the money now. Then the second round, when you apply, I don't see any problem with putting the second draw in that same bank account. Um, so that you can keep a track of everything. So here's a question, Beverly. Can you, you, you talk about us being digital. So let's say you put all the money in your business account. You're paying off, um, you're paying off your mortgage, you're paying it off utilities, and you move that money into your personal account to pay off those bills. Does that work? Or once you put that money in your business account or whatever account you set up for that loan, everything should be drawn off of that account as in checks or digital payments. Because if people have automatic payments set up through their other account, they would have to switch it over to this special account. So let me go back because I, I you said something and I would just want to make sure everybody's clear. When I talk about mortgage, I'm not talking about the home mortgage. Right? No, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, yeah, yeah. The business, yeah. If you have a okay. if you own a business building and or your business owns a building and you're paying the mortgage interest? Yes. So your question is um, when it goes down to digital. Right. So, you, so if so if someone owns a building or is paying the rent on their office and they've already set that up with an account, a business account or a separate account or a private account, they got this loan in 
and they set up an account for the loan. Now they're moving money from one account to the other account to, a pay, to pay from the second account that's already set up for automatic payment. Yeah, I don't know that I would move money that way. I think I would maybe stop the direct debit on the old account that I Not normally it. use. And I would set up debit, uh, direct debit on the one where the PPP funds is. Because you want as clean a trail as possible. Right. Okay. So even when you pay yourself, you want to write yourself a check each month. And I know people say, well, I don't use checks. I mean, I, I ordered a $10 check off of Vistaprint, right? Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to show a clean trail of me paying myself. And uh, from that business bank account. Now that's a good little nugget because I don't have checks, so that's a good little nugget to know. I've learned something today. Thank you. For yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I don't want any questions right. about how this, these funds were were used. Right, right, right. Okay. So this slide talks about how the money must be spent. 60% of loan proceeds must be spent on allowable payroll expenses. We've already talked about maybe three slides earlier. What are the allowable payroll expenses? And borrowers may now spend up to 40% on other qualified expenses. So the other qualified expenses are, again, rent, mortgage, interest, utilities. And under the new PPP, um, it was expanded to covered property damage costs, covered supplier costs, and covered worker protection expenditure. So the worker protection expenditure I know has to do with people that may have upgraded their offices to be to have um, PPE, right? The, the equipment to keep people safe. The I'm not, you'd have to figure out, you'd have to do a little bit more go to SBA for guidance on what the property damage cost is and supplier cost. I'm, I'm not sure. I know I saw it, but I'm not sure what it is. All right, also in the Consolidated Appropriations Act, other forms of small business relief. We talked about already the idle grants. You can get up to a full $10,000 in grants for qualified small businesses, which is what Congress intended in the very beginning under the CARES Act. There's also additional pandemic unemployment benefits for self-employed and independent contractors. And the SBA also will cover payments on eligible SBA loans for up to $9,000 per payment for the next three to eight months. And then there's also $12 billion set aside for community development institutions and minority development institutions because Congress is really trying to target low-income neighborhoods in order to revitalize them and make sure that they get part of the funding. And live venues, independent movie theaters, and cultural institutions may be eligible for, there's dedicated grants. It's like the shuttered grant, um, shuttered venue grant. And that's a whole nother area and you can't get this grant and PPP, so you really have to decide which one is going to be better if you are, if you fit into one of those categories. Landlords also get benefit from rental assistance and. Oops, sorry. There you go. And childcare businesses also. Um, there's an allocation for childcare businesses also. You got to go forward, Danielle, not backwards. I know, right? We're, everything's <laughs> forward, always going forward. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just doing a time check right now. Okay. So idle overview, we've, we've had plenty of uh, presentations on idle before. Same thing, you have to show economic disaster relief, some kind of injury. Um, and... This is kind of like a repeat. You get up to $2 million. The interest rate is 3.75 if you get one of those loans. Actually, the original was $2 million. The SBA um, changed it to $150,000 and so that more people could get the funding. So Congress went back and retooled it. My understanding is that it's still at 150 
$6,000 for this extension. Um, and this is an old slide, I can tell, because it's now been extended to 2021. The difference between IDLE and PPP, PPP is really about workforce sustainability. Do you have employees? Are you trying to get your employees, um, are you trying to keep them still working? And then they, the way you spend PPP is narrowly focused still. It's still all about pay, uh, paying paychecks and then with a couple of other items, expenses. And the loan is forgivable. You apply through your bank or financial institutions. And this is now available. Like I said, this, I know this is a, I was cutting and pasting <laughs> while I was doing, but this is an old slide. It still is available. I, um, Idle is different, right? Idle comes from the SBA. So you have to apply through the SBA and you could actually use it for basically anything when it comes to, to um, paying your business expenses. So it's definitely not res restrictive. So you have to decide which one you want to apply for. I think a lot of people like PPP because it's forgivable, whereas idle, you know, you have to repay it back. But again, we're talking about an interest rate of 3.75, which to some people, you know, is not a big deal, particularly when you look at the open market and what they're charging the interest rates. Oh, hey, that totally went away. Where did it go? <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, let me do, let me check the chat to see if there's questions. Okay. And let me see how I can get the pre presentation back. I am not sure how it went away like that. That is so weird. And I can't even stop the um, share. Huh. Okay. There I we go. Okay. Go ahead. All right. I just, I see a question. It was about a couple slides back from, is it Vitaly? Did I answer that question for you when you're saying 25%? Yeah, I said 25%. You're comparing, my understanding is that you compare to quarter, first quarter 2019 against first quarter 2020, first quarter 20, second quarter, you know, 2019 against 20, second quarter 2020. And, um, and again, I already shared with you if you weren't in business the full 2019 you can choose any quarter now that's the guidance that i have thus far there's a good chance the sba could change it or further clarify this but i'm pretty confident that's how it should be are we back on the right slide qualifying for idle yes we are okay cool. Right. how do you qualify for idle you need to have a minimum Experian score of 570. And you can have a 600 or 650 with Equifax or a 650 with TransUnion. The SBA is only pulling Experian. The last we checked, they were only Experian, pulling Experian. So you want to know what your credit score is for Experian. If there's anything on there that you can do to maybe boost your credit score, then you want to do it so that you can get it above, you know, 570. And 570 is actually really low. And I've had clients reject it. And we've had to do an appeal um, because they may have been around 620. And the SBA rejected them for unsatisfactory credit. And we've done an appeal and successfully won the appeal saying, hey, no, you know, the minimum credit score is about 570, right? So they also look to see whether there's no liens, no judgments, no delinquent federal debt, no active bankruptcies, demonstrated financial economic need. These are all things that they look at. I mean, we've had clients approved where they may have had tax liens, um, which is also a federal debt and they have tax liens. But I'll say this, it's the whole situation that the SBA also will look at. Right. So if you get denied, then and you can put together a good argument as to why you may have a tax lien or as to why you um, 
may have some outstanding federal debt, there's a good chance that you may have a successful appeal. Application process, like I said, same thing. You, you apply through SBA, you gotta have financial statements and tax returns. The SBA is looking for tax returns. That's why you need to have tax returns. All right, and then this is all about the all the stuff that you have to sign when you apply for EIDL, the promissory note, certifications, loan authorization agreement. Then you have the agreement terms, which is you deferred for 12 months. You don't have to pay for 12 months. I think earlier I said 18 months, but it's 12 months. Um, it's a 30-year loan, collateral over 20, 25,000. You have to commit within two months that you're gonna accept the funds and um, there's some other stuff. Let's see, required to maintain, oh, you're required to maintain the, your book. Yeah, this is all about record keeping. You wanna make sure you have the records that in the event I, uh, the SBA audits you, you wanna make sure that you have, you know, the documentation proving that at the time that you applied for the loan, that you, you know, that you filed a correct tax return, that you uh, did have economic injury, and you want to continue to make sure that you show a record of how you spent the money too. And this is how you can spend the money for IDLE capital expenses, normal day-to-day, -day, accounts payable, you can make payments towards debt. And then there's some restricted use in you know, the list before, no dividends or distribution payments, no distributions, disbursements, disbursements to owners. You can't repay stockholders or principal loans. You cannot expand your facilities. Um, you can't do acquisition of fixed assets or repair or replacement of physical damage, or you can't refinance that, those kinds of things. So I will say this, that's with your idle funding, right? That's why, but if you have money coming into just operating money, you can do those things, you're not restricted. That's why it's important for you to have separate bank accounts so that there's no commingling and you can clearly show the SBA that, hey, um, I did not use any of these idle funds to acquire any fixed assets, right? I did that through my operating account. Um, or I didn't expand my facilities using these idle funds. This is clearly what I, sh what I use the funds for, the intended use. And these are the learning objectives. Oh, yeah. You can keep going. You can go past this. Okay. <laughs> All right, and this is the contact information here. There's another counselor, Lisa Anderson, who normally does these presentations with me, and she wasn't able to join us today, but my contact information is 301-306-1234, and my email is beverly at irshelpattorneys.com. Hey, Beverly, can you tell people what to expect when they... Uh, schedule time with us that we are we are counselors we're not actually doing the work for you but we are there to counsel you through it so can you just give them an example of a typical meeting with you if they schedule time with you uh, what that would look like so you definitely for me um, just go to the SBDC center and schedule a meeting I think Leona will give a follow-up email letting us know you get on the calendar and let me know what you want to talk about ahead of time. That way I'll have some background reference. And we normally spend about 30 minutes discussing whatever your needs are. It may be, you know, you're trying to determine your eligibility for PPP, or you may have been denied, let's say, idle funding, and you want to figure out whether or not you have something that we should appeal, you know, if you have grounds for appeals. So we're happy to kind of figure out what the issue is and whether or not we can help you. All right. Um, Let me also say this about the second round of PPP and the first round. 
where you need to go. And Daniel, you may have some insight too, because in the first round, you know, I think the fintech companies were really the ones that were taking a lot of new customers. What I'm finding with this second round of PPP, the banks that took a lot of new customers in the first round, they aren't taking new customers. Like they only really want to deal with their customers. Yeah. So I think fintechs are going to be big community uh, credit union, community banks. If you are, if you think you want to apply for PPP, whether it's the first round or the second round, what I've been sharing with people is that they need to reach out to their banks today, today, and see whether or not they are accepting applications. Have they opened up the portal? The first round opened Monday, January 11th. Now, whether or not the bank, your particular bank, has opened up their portal, you need to check with them. The second round opened up today. So you definitely want to be one of the first people, second people in line, because remember the first time this stuff came out, the money went just like that, right? So you want to make sure that you put yourself in position to figure out whether or not you're eligible and whether or not your bank is accepting applications. And this is a good time to just think about as um, business owners, you should have a relationship with your bank. So uh, they they know my name. Like when I walk through the door, they're like, oh, Lord, here she comes again. <laughs> but it's a good idea to have a relationship with someone at your bank or someone at your credit union, um, particularly if you're going after them for tens of thousands of dollars. Right. But uh, it's just good business practice, period, to have relationships with your bank. Where your where your business where your business account is where you're doing business with because as Beverly said at this point they really either want to do business with people they're already doing business with or they want you to open up an account and do business with them um, and then the money goes very quickly it's just great business practice to go ahead form those relationships you never know when you might when you might need them right 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 we have a couple of questions in the chat. One is, is the $10,000 grant still available? Yes, it is. It actually ran out, but under this new act, it's it's refunded. So yes, it is available. And then um, that was from Ivan. And then the next question was from Gabrielle Scott. If you receive idle during the first round and got $1,000 per employee, okay, I think she, she may have answered that question for Ivan. Um, and then Emmanuel had a question right under that. He said, I completed and submitted by closing documents for IDLE um, loan back in December, but still haven't been funded. Uh, is there an ETA for the distribution of funds? So it's interesting to see when he actually applied in December because the it was closed and then they actually just reopened it and reappropriated funds. So the question is, does he have a loan number? Is there a loan number? Uh, he says, yes, he does. Oh, he has a loan number. Okay. Does he have a direct point of contact with anyone? Emmanuel, go ahead. In the ch Emmanuel, you can go ahead and mute yourself. Oh, he said he was approved back in June, but he didn't get his acceptance until December. Oh, okay. If you have a direct point of contact, what you can do is follow up with that direct point of contact because, uh, I mean, they are, SBA is kind of like IRS. They they just don't have the manpower to deal with the, the huge demand of funding. And I know, you know, you have to stay on them. You have to call them just to kind of get an update. Or if you have a point of contact, just send them an email and just say, hey, I was approved in June. Um no, I applied in June. I was improved in December. Can you give me some timeline as to when I can, can expect funding? Yeah, so I don't currently have a point in contact, but I've just been using the SBA hotline. And what they currently tell me is they can't provide any ETA on disbursement of funds. Um, so if you have a point of contact, I could reach out. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you going try to go through the back door. <laughs> yeah. I, are you, is he a member of the SBDC? Is he? Are you, you a, to, are you Emmanuel? Are you a DC SBDC client? 
Uh, yes, I am a member. If he wants to go and schedule a call with me, then I think that's the most appropriate way. And then I can try to see if I can uh, find someone in S SBA that can give okay. us a point of contact. Will do. And then Shani, I guess this question is the difference between the grant and the loan. She wants to know, can you apply for an idle grant? And can you apply for the grant without applying for an idle loan? She received the loan the last go round, but not the grant. So I'll say this, it's been so long since I've actually applied for the grant and the loan. So I don't know specifically, but the guidance is at the SBA.gov. Um, I'm not sure whether or not you can apply for them differently. I feel like you can. I feel like you can apply for the grant only and not necessarily the loan. But the other thing, if you receive only $1,000 the first round, how do you apply for the full $10,000? Again, it's going to be at the sba.gov website. We're still waiting for them to, to release guidance on that. But the question is whether or not you meet the criteria, too, for the full $10,000. And I don't know that people are going to meet the criteria. Most people probably have 300 or less um, employees, but the question is, can you show a 30% reduction, which is part of the requirements, and are you in a low-income neighborhood, which we're waiting for the SBA to define what low income is. So that's why I say it's going to be important for you to continue to look at the SBA website and see how they define it and when they'll put out the portal for idle grants. And things are changing so um, quickly, Beverly. Do you recommend people check the SBA.gov website every day, a couple of times a day, like things are going so fast and so quickly that it's hard for everybody to keep up. Yeah, I mean, I would say probably at least once a week. Um, if you have time to sit and check every day, I don't know. <laughs> is it changing that fast? Like from one day to the next, is it changing? Or is it changing well, from week to week? You know, we're, we're both on the same listserv. I think as stuff gets updated, we get, we, you know, you can always sign up for the listserv too with the SBA. And as things get updated, they will send you out an email. So. Cool. Well, Beverly, I know you're on a tight schedule. We've gotten through the questions. You've given everyone a lot of information. Uh, for those of you that want to come back and listen to this presentation again, it will be on our YouTube channel in about a week's time from today. And around that time, it should be available on the website as well, along with the slides that she provided. I'm going to back up just a little bit. This is the contact information for you here. You can schedule time on dcsbdc.org or you can reach out to Beverly and Lisa at the emails provided. And I just wanna thank everybody for joining us. This is a complicated issue that continues to get complicated as we move forward. Yeah, are you talking about this legislation is 50, over 5,500 pages? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that we had to read between December 27th and today. So no one person is gonna have all the answers. Right. Um, and even if we read the entire 5,500 pages, again, we know that the SBA is going to further, you know, give us guidance. So, you know, some questions I just, I just can't answer. It's just a humongous task for, you know, us as practitioners to kind of read and know everything. Well, we appreciate you taking um, time to walk us through this. So we thank you for that. I thank you for that. And again, you guys continue to talk amongst yourselves, reach out to your counselors, and we are going to see you the next time. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys.